this is the Raw and Radical Woman in the Arts podcast, and I am your host, Maureen Broadbeck. In each episode, we explore the mechanisms of identity, vulnerability, authenticity, empowerment, and social change through conversations with inspiring women who are making history and challenging the status quo in both the art world and in society. We talk about their real life challenges and celebrate cis and transgender women so that you can be inspired, empowered, take action and further your critical understanding about what it means to be a woman in the arts. Women, a revolutionary catalyzing reformation. Radical. Today we are welcoming Mimiko Turkan. She calls herself a visual narrator, intimate outsider, subjective documentarist. She creates artworks such as photography series, artist books and videos, focusing on gender roles and socially constructed identities. She investigates desires and fears, stereotypes, social roles and power relations. She got a Bachelor in Fine Art from the Istanbul Bilgi University in the Photography and Video Department in 2004 and she got her Master's degree in Fine Art at the University of the Arts in London, the Central St. Martin's College of Art and Design in 2010. Traveling is an important part of her artistic process. I had the chance to meet Mimiko at the gallery Analix Forever here in Geneva where she was for a few days and where she's showing her video, Energy, watery incantations in a group show called water paintings we discussed the making of the video and how it was so important in her life and process and we also talk about fear flow and the power of intention please welcome mimiko terkan hi mimiko welcome to the show we are today at the gallery analytics forever where you are exhibiting a wonderful video you are a turkish video artist and photography artist and uh, you are exhibiting here, so please uh, tell us how you got to start photography and video. Thank you, first of all, for reminding me. I've been uh, working on photography and video for over 10 years now. I've had a photography and video degree, and on top of that, I, uh, I went to London for a year of master's uh, education for in fine arts. And since then, I've been I've been based in Istanbul, where I'm actually uh, from, and I've been exhibiting a bit here and there in Europe, mostly and in Turkey. My first um, point of interest uh, in visual arts was, or my main theme uh, was socially constructed uh, gender roles, but with a focus on on the female identity. Mm because that would be how I would define myself. Yeah. So first of all, I think it was um, it was kind of a late teenage anger based mm-hmm. uh, discover self discovery <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> coming a bit later in in my I don't know like um, in in the early twenty uh, in my early twenties, and then it evolved into something more maybe um, that would communicate to more people that would mean something to a broader audience than just just uh, just a self-discovery thing so um, and uh, I, I'm also uh, very interested in doing physical activities mm-hmm. which also has an influence on what I do in my art practice yeah. um, so for example I've been training in Thai boxing and Muay Thai for, um, I don't know, for more than 15 years maybe. And at some point I was really interested in doing a project which involved me going to, traveling to Thailand. That was my first ever uh, trip to to Asia, to Thailand. And I had this idea to do a project, a visual, a photography project about the sexual services industry mm. over there with a uh, focus on the uh, Western customer. Yeah. But then it became something else because I also went there to train like six times a week, two times a day. And so it was the, the project at the end became something different, but something that I was really content with. So it's not just about gender, but it's this fluidity between genders in the case of earning money through your body within the Thai boxing mm-hmm. 
uh, world uh, and also with a more traditional way as we we are more accustomed to uh, like the sexual services mm. Mm. but now here I am uh, like for the last three years working on uh, water mainly I, I still feel it's a bit difficult to explain what was the link exactly mm. I still I'm still working on uh, explaining it in a more tangible way but I, I can feel I mean I, I, even at that time I felt the the connection on how I kind of felt it was the end of me working on human gender roles yeah, yeah. and then that work developing into something else it expanded yeah I still don't have the maybe exact words for it but uh, I think I, I, it's uh, why I was more focused on video and which is the main theme of uh, the video I'm showing mm -hmm. right now here mm -hmm. in Geneva in an exhibition where you have a work as well yeah. Yeah. Uh, so at first I was I had this feeling that okay we're all talking about the climate emergency yeah. what we're doing to to nature the environment the waters and uh, I felt this similarity between how we would be telling a fairy tale like the princess the beautiful princess is now a victim of i don't know whatever but like the female identity is a victim and she needs to be saved and it felt like we were talking about I mean, or the in the mainstream media and our in our mainstream parts of our brains it was like hmm, that's we're, interesting yeah uh, okay, nature is our victim, and now we have to save her. Like, yeah. And it also connects with all these traditions and rituals where we see Mother Earth, uh, Mother Ocean, or the soil is like the fertility. Also refers to the female identity. So it felt like there was some something wrong with it because I don't think as women we are victims. I mean, we there are obviously lots of situations where there is a real violence mm. or crimes committed mm. against women but i don't think we should see ourselves as just victims because that puts us in the in the, in the, in the toxic you know yeah. uh, way of um, so you seeing. think we can we can really feel empowered to actually take our power simply and stand yeah. for ourselves yeah yeah definitely yeah so that's mainly how I came to yeah. work with uh, or about. Uh, I, I think it's really interesting this idea of uh, looking at this whole environmental issue as as this fairy tales because in a way it's uh, it's very abstract. We know the planet is in danger. We know what's happening, but it's so abstract in a way for us at least because we don't live it every day. So it feels like a far, far, far away <laughs> tale. Yeah. That's true. And yeah, it's about saving her, Mother Nature. Yeah. So tell us about the video you're showing here, because it's a very beautiful video with multiple images uh, in the same time. You divided the screen in yeah. three parts. Thank you, thank you. I had actually taken a lot of video images right before, up until the point that the global pandemic was announced. Mm. So I was kind of, I felt I was lucky to have all these material, even though I, if I were able to travel, like uh, at the beginning of 2020, I would mm. have gone some other places as well. But still I had a lot and too, maybe even too much images, too, like hours and hours and hours of footage. That was a good thing, like for the for the beginning of the lockdown where I was you know yeah. I had my hard disks with uh, full of footage and I had uh, yeah. this project I want to work on but I had a faint idea of what I actually wanted to do so because it, usually I have more or less a narrative in mind when I'm starting a project but then I just let it flow like yeah. I, yeah. I don't really think about it when while I'm uh, filming or while I'm taking the images but then after a while when I'm done with filming, then I'm trying to think about what what's actually the narrative, what's the real thing I'd like to explain or or, yeah. or um, share. So, so then at the beginning of the confinement, I didn't really know what I was going to do with all these, even though I had this feeling 
It took me a lot of time finding out. So at first I started with just a two screen, two channel uh, mm. video idea. Uh, and I, the first bit of the video I actually put together was a part of what I would call like drawing. So again, with uh, this link with uh, the physical activities I, I like to do, which also uh, flows into my work, is um, so I've been trying to learn to how to wave surf for a while, for a long while now. And my learning curve was just about probably everybody else up until some point where I think I really got scared. And, you know, like um, nothing extraordinary happened. It's just... I got scared at some point, like mm. being underwater, and I kept on trying to surf. But when I when I mean I'm uh, kept on, it's like I don't know, like two weeks a year, because it's not just you know uh, right where I live. It's yeah, I have to yeah. travel, I have to take holidays, whatever. But then I tried to dig into that fear because I really mm. like to do mm. that. I like to see that the fear or look at it in the face and. Mm. I think that's also what drove me to work on water. It's like, okay, there's something flowing and if you just let it flow, then it, you would be less harmed. Or I think it's just maybe like the fear. You, should, mm. you shouldn't just hang on to your fears. You should just maybe mm. leave them be or flow yeah. to where so, they're going. Yeah, in a way, so it's accepting the fear and actually kind of diving into the fear. Yeah. To, and, and your intuition also to, yeah. to understand that strong link we have with water at the end yeah. of the day because for you work with body you explore the space of the body in life right yeah mm -hmm. and i think it has a lot to do with um with fear as well like we have a stereotyped image of the body as it should be or but it also obviously it depends on the context like if you're an athlete it's something else if yeah. Or whatever, but in general, we have this. There's a pressure on how the body should look or how the body should perform, etc. So, I think it just like this fear of not fitting into that. I mean, there's there could be a fear about not fitting into that mm. stereotype, or it could also be accepting yourself as it is. Is I think it's there's a part of fear in that situation as well. It's like okay, I I see what. I am, I will see how I look and and also with aging, it's like, okay, I see how my body cannot perform as it used to, mm. etc. Yeah. So um, yeah. I think we have to, um, we have to have a kind of a practice of looking into ourselves and mm. getting in touch with that fear. I mean, obviously water is among other things and among many other beautiful things it's also something scary in a way yeah. yeah yeah or destructive so it's i think it we have to have a we have to find a flow maybe our flow or something that connects with flow in general if that's something that exists i yeah. mean i not certain of course but maybe yeah 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 that's true so in this video you went to film different spaces can you talk about why you choose those different areas to film so the first one I actually chose in order to do this project was Lake Baikal in South Siberia. But it, it didn't start there, it actually started in, 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 in a feeling in, in a winter holiday in the Alps when I went for snowboarding, again, mm. this physical bodily experience I need. But then, so the trip began in, in Baikal, I, I believe. So I had a bit of information from years uh, back i don't remember even when but i always felt a bit of connection with this area uh, which is uh, just a little bit north of mongolia mm. so i'm from turkey and i have parents from all over this geographical place but uh, one part of my family as we know they're from uh, central asia i mean they would been i don't know how many generations before but you can still see it in their like face uh, features, features yeah. Um, so, and I, I'd say that part of the family still has some traditions that I would see in mm. the shamanic, maybe, Interesting. Uh, yeah. things. So I, will, I always had a, this uh, interest for that area. So, uh, so I, I knew a bit of things about that. So, um, but I knew that that lake was kind of sacred. 
it was considered sacred by all of the people or tribes that lived there for uh, and who are living there um, nowadays. I always have this kind of intuitive thing that whenever I come across something that maybe I feel that that flow yeah. in between that thing and me, that can be an idea, a place or I don't know. I always follow it and it mm. always leads me to where I need to be. So that was that kind of a thing. So I, mm. the more I look into it before like booking a ticket, it was like, okay, I have to go there. And I was, I don't know if it's luck or if it's, if it's just, if it was how it meant to be. Uh, it was in April. So it was just when the ice would start melting mm -hmm. because it's, it's, it's a huge body of water, but it, it freezes in winter and then in summertime, it's just like a seaside place where people go bathing. So, so April was the perfect time for me, actually, because I would see the ice, but also places where it was, the ice was fractured and the... the Melting. Yeah. yeah. So there was liquid water as well. So it was really magical. I still, today, I can feel a physical connection with that place. Mm. I don't know, it's maybe a f flow in the body. Mm. something that was a personally very important moment for me not just because I started the project there maybe but it's mm. just I'm so glad I was there mm. not just doing it for the project but just for mm. for my own sake mm. let's listen to an excerpt of the video energy watery incantations thinking with water flowing with ancient data Breath swelling with the undulations, heart pulsating with the waves, mind resonating with the tides, the rumbling of the waves, the pulsation in my veins. Where does my body end? Where do our bodies end? And where do you begin? Where do yours begin? Water in the body. Water bodies. Water in my body. Can my body move like the ocean? Can it flow as such? Can I breathe like water, such as the ocean swells, with ease, with the rhythm of the flux? The ocean of my consciousness is a drop in the ocean of all there is, all there was, all there ever will be. It's interesting and very important what you mentioned to follow the intuition. I'm also a big believer in this and uh, also I believe that following your fear or your fears is really key to discovering new ways for your life and your creative process actually. I think following the fear is, is like a big deal. We try to avoid it all the time but jumping right in it I think it's super important. So the final video can you talk about it and what you want to say? Because there's a beautiful text also over it. And I was wondering if uh, you consider yourself a feminist or even an eco-feminist. Um, so first of all, the video now became a three channel, three screen video uh, because I needed, I think I needed more space and more temporality and mm -hmm. so that the third channel allowed me to do that so that I can mix all of these different images from different places. So besides Baikal, there's a Bali in Indonesia, there's Oceanside in Portugal, there are so the Alps, usually the Swiss Alps actually, uh, there's Geneva, Venice, a little bit of Istanbul and other parts in Turkey like Eastern uh, Turkey, Kars. Mm -hmm. And so you can see different phases of water or different ways of manifesting of the waters through these three screens mm. uh, combined in different ways. And there's a text which I read and the text, I wrote it in a long time as well. 
it was like bits of notes that I would take and and then I tried to put them together and they kind of worked mm. in a way that I wanted to um, include it in the video, which is not something that I'd done before. Actually, it, it finishes with the drowning scene, as I would call it. When I see it now, it's not about drowning and it's not about just the fears, but it's just that part of following the flow doesn't really mean mm. it's all going to be the best conditions ever. It's just that's how it's i mean if on the road you get a bit you know i don't taken in by the water and splashed yeah, uh, yeah. no it's that's that's it i mean yeah if i'm a feminist or not i i first i don't think i'm an eco feminist maybe because i find it difficult to navigate you know the different parts of the feminist discourse yeah but Obviously, I'm I'm all for gender equality for mm. uh, all genders. So in a way, I'm a feminist. Obviously, I feel like I always have to make detours in in all these sometimes conflicting discourse mm. Mm. in the feminist ideas. Mm. So I wouldn't say I believe women are more inclined to have a innate connection with nature and water, for example. Mm. I don't really think so, but I, mm. I'd say we have a huge role to play in how we have to change all these situations that we're into uh, in terms of the climate emergency. Yeah. So in an interview, Bill Viola, he said something that I really love and it really reminds me of what you said about being underwater when you surf and starting to have this fear of being under the surface and really feeling, I'm guessing, how powerful the ocean is and how powerful water is. And he said that uh, he had this experience of drowning as a six-year-old boy and he got saved by his uncle, I think. And he said this is when he realized, and I'm going to quote him, he said, the real thing is under the surface. I think that's very beautiful and I think it really relates to, to you experience really of uh, because that must have been some kind of a starting point to investigate water actually yeah yes exactly like um, I, I mean I had all these questions like why what's what's that fear related to exactly like is it is it the fear that I'm not going to be able to resurface after being taken in mm. the, the wave inside or is it the um, total loss of control mm. Am I a control yeah. freak then? Like, you know, yeah. all these yeah. interlinked uh, questions. And then you can read a lot of, you know, surfers explaining how you survive, you know, a big wave crash, crashing on, on your head. It's like they say, okay, try not to breathe out. Try to, try not to crisp your muscles. Try to relax, even though obviously it's not a situation where you can relax. But, uh, I mean, those are actually tangible yeah. Um, suggestions which I was never able to do. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, okay, what's wrong? And also, like, asking myself, like, then if I can't overcome this fear, why do I keep doing this? Do I, I mean, why do I keep torturing myself? And, um, but also that, that kept me going into directions where I would say, okay, it's like, if you don't put the right intention, then obviously it's not gonna happen mm -hmm. and I realized that uh, whenever I was pedaling and seeing a big wave and but what, what I mean by big wave is just one meter maybe it's, it's not even that big it's not even that powerful but for me it was and when I was pedaling I I realized I wasn't actually putting the intention of getting up on the board and surfing the wave I was just putting the intention of recreating my feet the, the moment of my fear and it just kept happening mm -hmm. so um, that was really like a mirror um, looking into myself into my own behavior in terms of how I react in the face of a threat or mm -hmm. or in the in the face of losing like or like a competition kind of Hmm. Do you do the right thing in order to win, or do you do does your fear take over and then you lose? I mean, yeah, no, yeah. No. I don't believe in competition kind of thing, but what I mean is like if you don't put the right intention, yeah. 
nothing happens the way you you'd like it to happen so i think it's the same with sometimes with my work so i spend all this time working on something and at the moment i ready to share it with other people so the audience could be an exhibition could be i don't know could be an online screening could be anything i felt that i wasn't also putting the right intention so i was also trying to pulling the work back and then you know what i mean so it doesn't really blossom into what it can become yeah. and i don't mean by that uh, how people will love it and i just mean how it should be accessible to as much as people as possible and then people decide if they like it love it or hate it or dislike it or whatever yeah. it's just i was pulling it pulling myself and the work back each time so it was similar to my way of surfing it's interesting because this is showing us how unintentionally powerful we can be sometimes huh? yeah definitely to just with our mind really yeah uh, with the intention we bring this is true this is very important you mentioned this yeah. because uh, our intention does a lot and the way we approach something does uh, huge I spoke with Barbara Pola, the owner of the gallery Analix Forever, where Mimiko is showing her video. And she tells us more about this video and the story behind it, how they work together and why it is so important to Mimiko and her work. Barbara Pola, the gallerist and uh, the creator of the show Water Paintings, that is uh, showing the video of Mimiko. I was wondering if you could talk about it. Yes, of course, and with pleasure, because I had the privilege, actually, to follow the work on this particular video. And it took Mimiko Turkan at least three to three and a half years to actually complete this video. This is a very important video for Mimiko because not only because it took her so long to do it, but it took so long because it was a very difficult subject. She actually tried to find out about her own consciousness of the world through the water. And it started with a lot of fear about the water and then she decided to explore it. But to explore it in depth, she went to Lake Baikal, which is the deepest uh, lake in the world, actually, to film this lake in particular. And um, she showed me along the lines, the images, the words she wanted to add. And... Uh, I was actually quite critical to what she did and she started again and we talked about it and again she started and at one point about a few months ago she came with this final version and I looked at it and listened to it and I just said this is it. This is it, Mimiko. You found out how your own consciousness integrates into the water and through the water into the world. And you're done with this particular piece. You're done with this exploration of your relationship to the world. Now you can move on to some thing different to something else, which is likely going to be the exploration of a more collective consciousness of the world. A little note about Barbara. Barbara is not only a gallerist, she is also a creator and a feminist author. And I recorded a really cool episode with her last season, where she talks about women's rights, feminism, and what it means to live outside the norms. So you live in Istanbul. How is it for women in the arts? in Istanbul? Um, I think it's um, regardless of it being in the arts or in other uh, other parts of the professional world, it's mm. difficult in general. But I think there is, in contrast, there is something still powerful about how usually women are raised uh, mm. in, in Turkey. It's also difficult to explain, but it's some kind of um, adaptive power I'd say maybe you're clear about how patriarchy works I mean you when, when I mean you're clear you're raised while being totally aware informed of, yeah of how patriarchy has a power on you 
But then you also have like usually watching other family members or maybe being not formally taught, but you can see how to move freely in a way among those patriarchal structures. Mm -hmm. It's a bit difficult to explain and I think it depends on a lot of other factors, but uh, there's something... I would say women are definitely not helpless in a way in Turkey. There's a mm. strong will to have power too, mm. but it's difficult in mm. general. The situation gets worse actually, as um, like recently how the president decided to... Um, I mean, he was the first... Uh, to sign a convention called Istanbul Convention for violence and crimes committed against women. And he decided he was gonna um, take back his his signature and, and take back Turkey's involvement in this convention, which was about guaranteeing some sort of uh, set of rules protection. when, for example, for some yeah, protection yeah. or uh, when someone would be... Um, judged how the, the how, how the women would be protected against him or etc etc mm -hmm. but now it's uh, or how the police would set their rules to explain how this police have to behave in the context of dealing with a woman who's been violated or abused abused yeah. etc yeah. so it's like one step forward two step backwards yeah Definitely. And do you think that the younger generation stick more together for that, men and women? Or is there a will from this younger generation to move forward? Um, I don't know if they stick together among genders. I'm not really sure about that. But in a way, what's interesting to see is that even in more conservative families, I mean, even for young people from conservative families, I feel that their role models have certain ways of living that are more equal, mm. if I can say equal. For example, it's the couple take care of the kid together. It's not just mom who's always mm. stick to the kid and pushes the, the baby car or is holding on to the kid. It's they share more responsibility in the family. And so I think... It has an impact on them, even though they're not... I don't think they're totally informed of what's women's rights, how it develops, how it should be put into action in the context of the infrastructures of the power mm. uh, in place, etc. I mean, I don't think they're totally aware of it, but they can clearly see in their role models, in the, the mainstream, you know, power couples, or even in the conservative ones, you can see clearly that there's a change. And so I don't think they would accept anything that would be too much of a backlash in their own personal freedoms. Mm. Interesting. Is there anything else you want to talk about or you want to say that's important to you? I, I think what I find most interesting is that as maybe opposed to the previous generations, I feel there's a lot more support in between women. Mm -hmm. And I'd say... That is uh, in the context of the arts entourage as well. Yeah, yeah. So this is really, this makes me really happy to, mm. to see that happening. Yeah. And I think that we need a lot more of that yeah. in all areas in life. Support between women. <laughs> Yay. That's a good way to end the podcast. I really loved how Mimiko talks about her fears and how she approaches fears and also flow and the concept of flow. I invite you to discover more about her and her work on the story of our website, where you will find all the links such as Mimiko's website, the gallery Analyx Forever's website, and the links to the social media accounts. Thanks for listening. This podcast is supported by Pro Helvetia, the Swiss Arts Council, the Republic and Canton of Geneva, and the city of Lancy in Switzerland. We are so thankful for their support and commitment to women, culture and the arts thanks for listening to raw and radical women in the arts podcast learn more about our featured artists and sign up for news and updates by visiting our website rawradical.com 
organic platform profound. Please consider leaving us a comment and review on your preferred podcast listening platform to help others discover the show and take part in this global dialogue. She intuitive. I am Maureen Broadbeck, and until next time, keep the dream alive. Woman, woman, woman.